welcome to uh, the next segment of the Turtis Batlaw Project, which is uh, addressed to a fairly common issue, namely that uh, a lot of kids are more interested in playing baseball, learning how to play baseball, than they are in learning how to play the violin. And it turns out there are really sound psychological principles that account for that. A uh, parent who uh, has aspirations for their child to become a musician may be disappointed that the child doesn't particularly enjoy practicing and is more interested in going out and playing with his friends, uh, playing baseball, joining Little League and so on. And if a parent or parents are uh, uh, think about this issue, you ask them, you know, why might that be the case? And uh, they're likely to tell you, well, he's just more interested in sports. He's more interested in sports than music. That explanation is not very satisfactory or not very informative for me as an experimental psychologist. Because in, I, I think, in fact, there are excellent psychological principles that account for that preference. It turns out that uh, many aspects of teaching baseball uh, take advantage of psychological principles that facilitate learning. There are three primary principles that are relevant in this situation. If you're trying to teach somebody a motor skill of some sort, you have to have a clear definition of what that motor skill is. Uh, you have to be able to uh, clearly identify when there were successful instances of that response and provide immediate feedback for those successful instances. So uh, those are the first two critical things, clear definition of the response and immediate feedback for correct occurrences of, of their appropriate response. And number three, there has to be a well-designed progression plan for teaching increasingly more sophisticated forms of the behavior. So let's look at how those three principles are exemplified in the case of baseball. Now I'm not talking about baseball strategy and there's a lot of thought and, and so on that goes into a, a how you design a game or respond to a game and so forth like that. Let's just talk about sort of fundamental uh, motor components, response components, playing baseball at the level of four, five, six-year-old kids. Well, the first thing they need to learn is how to throw the ball and throw it so that it lands near the person you want it to ca catch the ball rather than somewhere else or too high over their head and that sort of thing. So throwing is one response. Catching the ball is another. They have to be able to catch a ball that's thrown to them. And of course, batting the ball so that uh, you make contact with it and send it flying into the outfield. <laughs> One of the things that's pretty clear about each of those three responses is a child at the youngest ages, like two or three, four years old, can easily identify when he succeeded and when he has not. That is, if a kid is trying to throw the ball towards somebody and throws it over the head and the person can't possibly reach it, that's immediately evident to the child. It's very clear what the correct response is and what are incorrect responses. And uh, the correct response is followed by immediate feedback. You know, the person catching the ball says, hey, that was a great throw, thanks, and then throws it back and uh, the interaction. Uh, continues. So you, you, you've got clear identification and knowledge of what the correct response is and what, what the, as opposed to the incorrect responses. And uh, the third component was uh, having a clear progression plan which uh, parents and kids sort of organize amongst themselves uh, without thinking about it. If you're first trying to teach a child to catch a ball, you don't send them to the other side of the uh, field and then toss a ball at him. <laughs> you uh, have him close by so, and, and kind of 
throw about a yard, yard and a half, and you start with a fairly large ball that's easy to catch and soft, that's easy to grab, and then you gradually increase the distance and decrease the size of the ball, and that's how we sort of naturally play ball uh, with kids, and similar progression uh, plan is built into uh, practicing having your child throw the ball towards you and so on. Now let's think about playing the violin, or I don't have the violin, <laughs> I have a viola. So it's pretty much the same thing. Think about what's the correct response and is it that clear to the child? I would submit that it's not at all clear what the correct response is to the child. There are, there are a lot of, it's, the reason we don't uh, give kids violins to throw around when they're three or four years old is there is a lot more complicated ways of interacting with an instrument. You've got to hold it in a particular position. Now what's the correct way to hold it? It's not at all clear to the child. It's not at all clear to the parent. Uh, often teachers begin with, by talking about the posture and, and how you stand even before you hold the instrument. And again, what's the correct way to do it is not inherent in the activity. And so you need a teacher that sort of explains all that. So there's a lot about playing the violin that you, you have to figure out what the correct responses are. And they, they go from holding the instrument, from position of the left hand, from placing the fingers. And, uh, and the placements have to be very Precise. I mean, if it's uh, if the placements are slightly off, it's out of tune. And uh, the teacher knows it's out of tune. The parent may or may not know that it's out of tune, but the child for sure does not know it's out of tune. So even if the finger goes up to the fingerboard in the correct position, whether it's correct or not is a mystery. Uh, to the child. And as long as the, the correct form of the response is a mystery to the child, it's very difficult for the child to get uh, immediate feedback about whether he's done the right thing. Uh, there are so many things to do correctly, left hand, and of course you get to deal with the bow hand, <laughs> there we go, hold it in a particular way, pressure, pressure on the string in a particular way, then you have to draw the uh, bow across the string at, at a specific angle, and, and there's nothing unique about the correct angle as opposed to the incorrect angle that tells the kid that he's doing it right or wrong. And so uh, you need the, uh, a teacher to provide that kind of feedback, and the teacher uh, usually can only concentrate on one response at a time, so there may be all kinds of incorrect uh, bow angle movements while the teacher is trying to work on the left hand and, and so forth and so on. So, Immediate reinforcement or immediate feedback is, is pretty problematic. Uh, uh, in my own personal history, I uh, stopped uh, playing the viola for about 35 years, uh, during which time I concentrated on my career as an experimental psychologist. But the interesting thing I noticed uh, when I came back to, uh, to playing the instrument is that I was a better mu musician than I had been when I before the, that 35 year break. And what made me a better musician is that I listened to music during those 35 years, I enjoyed listening to music, and I gained a better appreciation for what the preferred sound uh, of uh, a particular note or a piece or uh, interpretation was. I, I, I gained a better sense of what was the preferred, sound to produce as opposed to the non-preferred sound. So, uh, and that's a lot of what children have to learn is, is what is the correct response. And finally, let's move to the, the third component, and that's the progression plan. In teaching a kid how to catch or throw a ball, the progression plan is so obvious that no one's ever written about it. <laughs> Parents automatically do it. They first buy the kid a soft, a fuzzy ball that's fairly large and easy to, to hold on to, 
and they kind of roll it from their lap to the kid's lap so there's not much of a distance involved and then you gradually increase the distance and change the, the properties of the ball and so forth. So how do you go from uh, a child who's totally <laughs> incapable of playing the violin and uh, uh, design the proper progression steps to get to a reasonable level of performance. That's a very, very complicated task, a very, very complicated task. And in fact, uh, if as an experimental psychologist, you were to ask me, how would you design a progression plan to train somebody to play the violin? I couldn't tell you. I'd consider that to be so, so complex that uh, I couldn't figure that out. So. Uh, my, uh, my deepest respect goes out to uh, music teachers who have been working on this problem for, uh, for centuries, essentially, and uh, have worked out some ingenious uh, uh, schemes for creating the correct uh, progression plan. And let me mention one other factor which also distinguishes baseball from playing music. And that's social reinforcement. Uh, learning is tremendously facilitated by the presence of others and particularly by the approval of others who you are interacting with. In order to learn to play the violin, you take violin lessons once a week, and during the interim, you're kind of on your own to practice and, and uh, make whatever progress you can and uh, uh, typically, a lot of the practice occurs in solitude. There's virtually no way to practice throwing and catching a ball in solitude. And certainly, all of the practice that occurs with kids, in the ages of three and 10, if you will, is social practice. They're practicing throwing the ball or somebody on the other end catching it, parent, another child, and so uh, it's a constant social interaction. So throwing the ball at practice is social. Uh, catching the ball, of course, is social interaction because someone throws it at, towards you. Batting practice is often uh, a social activity. In uh, Little League uh, baseball, uh, kids typically have a couple of practice sessions uh, a week uh, during which there are several coaches. Uh, that provide a lot of uh, social uh, uh, feedback and reinforcement for progress. And then the once a week, there's a game that actually counts, and uh, all the parents turn out for the game. And, and if a kid happens to uh, uh, make a successful play, certainly if he hits a home run, there's a lot of cheering that goes on. And furthermore, the child can take that information. He says, I hit a, go a home run in a game yesterday. And when he goes to school the next day, he can tell other kids about it who appreciate the magnitude of his accomplishment. Now compare that to what happens in training a kid to play the violin or, or other musical instrument. There's way less social interaction. If uh, a kid uh, announces in class, hey, I successfully played that scale, other kids in the room are not going to be particularly impressed. So the social support is way different. It's way different. And of course, uh, this uh, fact uh, is, has, didn't escape music instructors. And, and uh, in particular, uh, there was a music teacher that created a system of music instruction known as the Suzuki Method, uh, in which uh, a lot of social support is built in such that the parents uh, are trained as much as the student, as the child is, so that the parent can provide the appropriate social feedback uh, during practice sessions and so on. Of course, the success of the program depends entirely on the extent to which the parents are involved, are interested, or successful in learning to uh, play the instrument. And uh, so there's a lot of variability in how well the Suzuki method operates based on, on the social component. So if somebody uh, tells you that uh, Johnny is more interested in baseball than playing the violin, 
because he's more interested in sports. It's not sports. It's the psychology of learning that is more naturally harnessed in the teaching of sports than it is in a teaching of music. <laughs> ¶¶ 